everyone, and welcome back to another podcast, Making a Difference in Mental Health. I'm your host, Danielle Young, with my co-host here with me, Wendy Greer. We're continuing our conversation and this series on looking at the impact of COVID on education and the school system. Today, we have a special guest here with us, Mr. Greg Edmondson, who is the Director of Student Welfare and Compliance for the Office of District-Wide Services and Supports. But before we get into our conversation today, I always have to say hello to my co-host. Hey, Wendy, how you doing? Hey, Danielle, I'm doing great. How are you? I'm so, so happy to have Mr. Greg here. Um, Greg and I have history. We worked together um, in Montgomery County when I was there as the administrator for Child Welfare Services. So our mission was always to work together and keep children safe. So I'm so excited that he's able to join us today, take time out from his busy schedule to be with us. Hi, Greg. How are you doing? Hey, Wendy. How are you? Thanks for having me today. Absolutely. Um, do you want to tell our audience just a little bit about what compliance, the Office of Compliance really is and what it is that you do? Sure. So um, I'm in the Office of um, Student Welfare and Compliance. And what that means is that we um, support schools and we support school administration as well as our offices to ensure that our students are safe, that their welfare is being not only looked at, but um, attended to in each and every situation possible. And so specifically, I'm the um, district-wide Title IX coordinator for the state of Maryland and for MCPS. And I'm also the child abuse and neglect contact. And so what um, our office is designed to do is to um, support our schools immediately when we have situations where there are allegations or suspicion of child abuse and neglect, as well as any reported Title IX incidents of sexual assault or sexual harassment of our students. You may know that we um, dealt with um, many of those instances during last summer when we had an outbreak of social media allegations from several of our high schools. And so our office uh, led a team designed to investigate and to respond and to support our students. And I kind of look at our office as kind of like a hub. And so we monitor all of our serious incidents that come into the school system. And then from there, if it's an incident of hate bias, we'll get the security team involved and we'll get our equity initiatives team involved to support our schools, whether it's in recovery or whether it's in preventative um, training that might be needed in the community. If it's a situation of, like I said, sexual harassment or any type of bullying, we will uh, not only make sure that we're following guidelines and responding in that area, but making sure that we provide the student supports. And so we'll outreach to our Office of Student Family Supports and Engagement, and we'll get our counselors and our school psychologists and, and the directors and the experts in those areas to ensure that the family has what they need, that the students have what they need. And as I mentioned, if it's an issue of child abuse and neglect, we're going to contact Child Welfare Services. We're going to get involved with um, possibly special victims unit, uh, possibly the state's attorney, and making sure that those external resources are also available, as you well know, like Treehouse and other agencies exactly. that might be able to help our kids. Yeah. Which would be one of us, ABH. <laughs> we get a lot exactly. of um, kids who have experienced um, child abuse and neglect. So absolutely, we love to partner. So we wanted to um, continue our discussion, as Danielle said, about COVID and the school systems and the challenges and distance learning. And you did mention, I just have one quick question. You did mention that there were social media outbreaks and with distance learning, did you see an increase in those types of situations because kids were home and they were on the internet and on distance learning? Um, we did compared to years prior to um, the pandemic. We dealt with, like I said, um, starting last June, we had hundreds of allegations that came in. We met with county council, we met with the board of ed, we met with the police department, uh, we met with our students to make sure we could hear from them and see what was going on and what we needed to do to really address the culture and the climate of our schools, even though our students weren't in the buildings because they were yeah. home. And so one of, right. the, one of the real issues that we have coming into this fall is that re-intersectionality of our students coming back together again. Mm -hmm. So they were in a communication, but it was a virtual communication. And they were, they were making friends with each other online and they were um, 
interacting in the cyber world. And so how do, what steps do we need to take to you know, re-engage them together in the actual brick and mortar buildings? And, and what steps do we need to take to ensure that all of our stu students feel safe coming back? Maybe there might have been an incident where there was some online bullying or cyber harassment. And so are we aware of, of those situations? And have we put in preventative measures and have we taken steps to ensure that we don't have any students coming back feeling stress or feeling anxiety about um, actually seeing somebody that they might have had a situation with. And so we're really working right, hard right. to support our schools in that area. Right. What are um, some of the challenges that you guys are facing um, from the school system as kids matriculate back into a building and face-to-face -face interactions? I can imagine that, you know, it's an adjustment situation from our point of view in mental health. Uh, we saw it when um, we went into distance learning and quarantining that initially everybody was so excited. All our young clients were, couldn't wait. They're like, oh, I don't have to go to school. And then that really faded quickly. And then we started to see symptomology of uh, anxiety, um, depression, um, isolation. It was just really, really um, difficult to see and try to treat. But now, you know, here we are moving back into the school system. And so what things do you see as a challenge that your team and your um, colleagues are working on to make it as smooth as possible? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of challenges. I mean, they're from, from the instructional level and looking at where kids are data wise and where they are with reading and writing and their math program and curriculum. Um, those challenges are real. Uh, mitigating uh -huh. that learning, mitigating that learning disruption to make sure that we have a really good handle on what that looked like. Um, a lot of people out there talk about learning loss over the course of these past 14 months. Mm, yeah, I personally, don't, I personally don't like that term. I feel like our students actually experienced something that no other students have in the past, and mm -hmm. so there was a lot of learning going on. It may not have been curriculum driven 100% like we would have wanted it to, but they really learn how to navigate themselves in an academic environment in a way that nobody else has ever had to do before. And so we just really have to look at the instructional side of it to ensure we understand what the disruption was, to obviously put in place those, you know, mitigative circumstances so that we can respond and um, address what each of our individual students are, what level they are with the with the academics as well as the extracurriculars that they've missed because a lot of our stress and a lot of our anxiety from our students came from not having those extracurriculars that they used to have. Uh, we have a, a significant group of our students who they do well in the classroom and they work hard for the, in the instructional piece, but you know they're motivated by being on that team or being in that drama production or exactly. seeing and being being coached and being driven to be better at something outside of the classroom. And so that's another big piece that our extracurricular and student services office is looking at. But those are some challenges that are, are concerning to us. Um, you know, our interim superintendent, Dr. Manifa McKnight, you know, prior to the end of last school year, um, rolled out a 2.5 year plan and, and really looking at how we're going to address some of our major challenges within a school system of 166, 67,000 students. And so, we broke that plan down into four categories. I mentioned the mitigated learning disruption. There's also a, a focus on our most poverty impacted schools. We also have a, a, a well-being and support team. And the final is that digital learning and support. And so we, we broke out almost every central office in, um, and ensured we had school representation into four different teams. And we're looking at these four different buckets, so to speak, or aspects of this mm -hmm. two and a half year plan. And each of these four teams are are really working on um, their own individual plan to be able to address these challenges and concerns. So I'm really excited about that plan. I think our interim uh, superintendent has done a great job of um, setting the vision for how we're going to address some of these challenges. Is, are there any plans to uh, expand wellness centers in high schools, middle schools? Absolutely. So one, our, our Be Well 365, you may be aware of, which is um, driven by our counselors, our school psychologists, our really therapeutic-based services for our students. They actually have guidelines for school-based student well-being teams to ensure that there is, within each school, 
a well-being team designed to to monitor, to engage in each of their students along the lines of um, social, emotional, mental health, making sure that each student and their needs are accounted for. And if that means you can't or don't have the capacity within the building, that we have an office to reach out to to make sure you get that support. It's a really, it's, it's really strong network. I mean, that therapeutic, um, informative instruction and that therapy, or I'm sorry, the trauma informed instruction and that trauma informed counseling is, is, is really taken off within Montgomery County to make sure that school counselors, our PPW workers, are really um, our ESOL. Um, bilingual assessment team, uh, just making sure that all of our students, especially our more vulnerable students, are provided with these supports. That sounds amazing. Um, and, you know, I'm going to plug Montgomery County because I spent most of my time working in that um, area and with your office. So it's nice to hear that the school system is really taking a hard look at ways to just increase the presence and children's lives and parents' lives and provide the best services and continually improving safety and well-being. So thank you for that. Any other things that the school has in mind to ensure that everybody's safe? This COVID, you know, we're COVID-19, we're looking at a new variant. I know on our end, from the mental health perspective, people are getting nervous, parents are getting nervous, kids are getting nervous again, um, just as they started to break out in be out and about now, the nerves are coming because school's coming closer and closer and everybody's wondering what it's going to look like. Do you have any comments on that or how your system is trying to address the ever daily changes in the science? Yeah, I mean, this strand is really coming at us, right? The the, 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 the Delta yeah. variants that everybody's talking about and just as we got through June and maybe even the early parts of July and people were thinking that life was returning to normal, this has hit all of us with a little bit of a step backwards in our plans. And now certainly we don't expect, nor do we think that we'll need to be going back to that virtual plan that we had before, especially in Montgomery County when we're looking at one of the highest vaccination rates in the, in the country. But um, it's a concern for the school district. It's a concern for our office and for um, district-wide service and services and supports team to make sure that we're monitoring it closely, that we're working with our Department of Health um, for, you know, guidance and for um, input and, and consult into what decisions that the Board of Education is going to make. You might have noticed this past week they they voted, our Board of Ed voted to um, return to masks for um, all staff and students while they're in the school buildings. Um, but we're, we're kind of just wanting to make sure that we get all the information and certainly we have a few more weeks before school starts, but Things could change even from what we're looking at today. I know that um, we have a team that works directly with our schools. If there's a, um, a student who's been diagnosed with COVID, if there is a staff member who's diagnosed with COVID, uh, we have a team who um, is basically available 24-7 to walk through school administration as well as our executive leadership staff to make good decisions about our schools and about whether or not whether who needs to be more um, quarantined and for how long and specifics like like those um, on an individual or on a classroom basis. But yeah, I mean, this is um, this is something we're, we're just monitoring really closely and seeing which direction it goes. Uh, just trying to make sure that we are returning to school focused on the things we need to focus on, but also I know we talk a lot about our students and making sure they're safe and they are our priority, but we have an employee assistance program and we have a, uh, Office of uh, Employee and Labor Relations um, op, uh, team and our our employees are equally important to us. We are making sure that they feel safe coming back to the buildings, that they have what they need and the supports that they need, as well as our administrators. I think um, I had a conversation earlier today with someone where I think the community and, and even ourselves, we kind of think as our principals and administrators and even our central office staff that we aren't going through this type of pandemic trauma either. And so, it, I mean, it's, it's affects all of us to a degree. And so we really have to self check ourselves and you know, who's fact checking the fact checkers, right? Like who is, who's, who's making sure that the people making decisions are in a good place about this. Cause this isn't easy for any of us. And I think that's a really important piece that we don't want to lose sight of. Exactly. All right, Greg, you know, you're, you've, 
bring up really and go right into our next phase of questioning. I was really just going to ask, how are your employees, your colleagues, your staff, how are they doing? But you went right into speaking about the EAP programs and the self-checks yeah. and the self-care. I know for us as therapists, too, when we were providing, um, as we continue to provide therapeutic support for our clients and for our teachers, and we partner with schools and we partner with uh, parents, that oftentimes, too, we have to do a self-check. We have to do self-care. And so you kind of answered it, but if you wanted to elaborate a little bit more with the EAP and with the self-care and the self-check, how is your team doing, especially now that we're going to be heading right back into the new school year? And all these initiatives and uh, visions and plans that you've spoken of are excellent. What about the workers? How is your team doing? We have about 20,000 employees in Montgomery County. It's one of the largest, uh, <laughs> the 14th largest in the district. And, and ensuring that um, our employees are, that's full time, by the way. We also have another six or seven substitute teachers and other temporary staff that six or 7,000 substitute teachers and temporary staff. So there's a, a whole lot of people that we want to make sure are well. Um, so like I said, we have an, um, an office designed specifically to ensure that our well-being of our uh, and the welfare of our staff and our faculty, our employees, no matter what role they are in, um, have the resources that they need, even if it's just someone to talk to. I know that um, I work closely with the director of counseling, and um, Dr. Cruz has, has said often and, and uh, where and whenever possible that our counselors are not only our student counselors, they are our school counselors. And so they are trained to be able to have a sit down with any of our adults, with any of our employees, and really gauge and monitor what's going on. And then if there's resources needed, getting our people help. I feel good that there's strong leadership in Montgomery County, and I think that the leadership have the skills in order to assess quickly where people are, but also know that they, as leaders, have support from central office, and they have support from outside agencies like yourselves if if we need to reach out and you know get extra help somewhere so it's you know think of those words global pandemic uh, this is not just hit Absolutely. students mm -hmm. it, it's hitting the three of us on this call um, it's hitting our families you know we've all or, or many of us uh, myself included have had lost through this and you know we all are managing it and trying to trying to um, cope and, and, and move forward as best we can. And we have a job to do and we're going to do it because we have a, a high level of expectation and a high level of pride within Montgomery County Public Schools. But we do have to step back every now and again and make sure that we are well in order for our kids to be well. I love that, definitely. And we just came off of a month of just reflecting on self-care, even as clinicians, as therapists, as counselors, as workers in the community, for students, for parents, for teachers, it is very important for us to make sure that we are well, that we are well. And so before we end, Greg, is there any tip, is there a tip for maybe students or parents or teachers or even any other resources that you could provide for our audience today that just would increase awareness? Yeah, so we, um like most good systems, we have almost any and, and all resources and documents and information available on our website on Montgomery County Public Schools. Our web team is um, just really highly skilled at um, making sure that they're visible and that they're easily accessible in multiple different platforms or, or formats. Just to go on our main Montgomery County page and search and you're going to find student welfare and compliance, you're going to find child abuse and neglect, you're going to find student services and our school counseling team and our school psychologist and any different type of support that you're looking for. We've really done a, a great job of um, connecting with Maryland Safe Schools. So if somebody reaches out to Maryland Safe Schools, we are immediately tipped and streamlined to the school administrator that needs it as well as the office that supports that school. We've worked really closely with Family Violence Center and the state's attorney's office to ensure that we're a part of the community outreach and the community awareness along the lines, especially during the, the pandemic times. Um, but I guess the, the tip is 
I haven't really, you know, I haven't re really written it down, but just don't keep it in. Mm. If you're, if you're, that's good. Uh, if you're struggling with something, I don't care if you're a 10th grader or a fourth grader or a 20 year veteran in the classroom or a, one of our um, transportation specialists. I mean, I think don't keep it in because there are people and there are resources. We are, again, we're a large district, but we are an extremely resourceful district. And uh, keeping it in is never good. It just leads to uh, more anxiety and more, more hurt, more frustration. And, if you have a concern or an issue, we will get you to the to the best possible place to help you. We just need to know what what's going on uh, with multiple offices. Just um, like I said, just don't keep it in. If it's something going on with you and a, and a friend online, and you feel harassed, or if you feel like there's an incident of hate bias, or if there's a, even a crime that's been committed, talk to somebody because we're also networked and we have just a a large communication uh, avenue within uh, Montgomery County that you talk to one office, the next office knows about it, and we're working together to get you help. Excellent, excellent. I hope that our audience took the message away from that. For your wellness and mental health well-being, don't keep it in. Greg, mm -hmm. we thank you so much for just coming and giving us so much insight into the work that you do and into the staff and the employees that support you and that support your county. Thank you so much for coming. Wendy, before we close, do you have any final thoughts about what we've heard here today? It's, you know, it's been, it was an amazing school system to work with and collaborate with. So I do, again, want to say big thank you to Greg for taking the time out to join us. He has given us invaluable information for the community. And I think, you know, we're all working toward the same goal. We have never dealt with anything like this before. So 20 and 2020 and 2021 are definitely a challenge, but I think if we continue to have these conversations, continue to collaborate, continue to discuss resources, we're gonna make it through. And I, I thank you guys um, for inviting me on to this. Um, to this opportunity. Wendy, it's so great to reconnect with you, and it was wonderful to meet you, Danielle. And if there's anything we can do uh, moving forward in collaboration, I'm all for it, and I know the school system as well. Great. So just keep this in mind as a resource, too, when, you know, along with Treehouse and any other, we do service Montgomery County as well. So we Absolutely. When you, when you reached out, I, I wrote down all, and I went on the website, and I got everything, so it's, it's another resource for us to make sure we connect with. Right, because we are about keeping children safe. <laughs> Absolutely. So. Excellent, excellent. So, Wendy, would you like to tell our audience what we have coming up next to round out the series? So, first of all, Danielle, it'll be you and I, but we have a special, special guest, which I'm not going to disclose. So, everybody <laughs> who's listening is going to have to tune in to our next right. episode <laughs> as we round out the month on um, education, systems, COVID, challenges, all of that. So I'm excited for our next guest. Excellent. So be sure to tune in, Mr. Greg Evans, and we thank you so much again for joining us. Audience, we thank you for tuning in. We hope that you tune in for our next episode to round out this series. My name is Danielle Young. I'm your host of this podcast, Making a Difference in Mental Health, with my co-host, Wendy Greer. We're striving to make a difference in mental health. We will see you next time.